Welcome to You Should Know, a series about the things you should have been taught in high school, but weren't. In each episode, we'll dive into a topic that's important to understand and easy to implement into your life. We'll talk to experts, break down complex ideas, and give you the information that you need to make informed decisions. So whether you're looking to learn something new or just want to stay up to date on the latest news, You Should Know is the place for you. So give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, and let's get started. So we're going to get started. I'm Danae Hicks with the Ellis County, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and I serve as your family and community health agent. I am bringing on a wonderful woman today to talk all things GMOs. So I'm going to let her introduce herself, and then we're going to get started. Hi, Danae. Well, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I am Jordan Bell. I am a research and extension agronomist for Texas A&M Life in the Texas Panhandle. So I primarily cover the top 26 counties of the Texas High Plains. Yeah, and with that, you've done lots of GMO research and have lots of background with GMO stuff, which is what we're going to discuss today, right? Yes. And so, of course, as an agronomist, I work with um, our primary crops in the region, as well as alternative crops. And when I first started receiving questions about GMOs or genetically modified organisms, it really first, my first thought was why not ask a breeder? Because of course the breeders that we have in the Texas A&M system are phenomenal and they are working with these traits every day. But then I also had to step back and realize that as an agronomist, I am working with producers who are using these crops and utilizing the traits in their systems. And so I really thought it was important that I educate myself about the pros and cons, what are people concerned about, and why these traits are beneficial for not only agricultural producers, but also consumers. And so that's really kind of how this um, came about. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Uh, I got to see Jordan speak at one of our conferences and literally went up to her after she got done speaking. It was like, hey, I have this podcast. Would you come on and talk GMOs with me? Uh, and some of my people that have watched know that I have a background in agriculture. I actually have a bachelor's in ag. So I have a fairly decent understanding, but I know a lot of the general population just don't know and don't understand. So we'll, we'll, kick it off with the first question. Can you explain what a GMO is? Definitely. So of course, when we talk about GMOs, we're talking about genetically modified organisms. And I think just that terminology right there um, is hard for many people to wrap their minds around it. It sounds like something extremely foreign, but really what we're talking about is just a trait, a trait that's unique to a crop and that has been modified genetically rather than through traditional breeding. And modifying genetically allows a breeder to speed up the incorporation of these traits into the crop of interest, rather than going through the traditional breeding process that can take years. And so this has really been beneficial for producers so that they can get these traits into production much more quickly. So what kind of traits are we talking about? Well, so primarily when we're talking about genetically modified organisms and these traits in crop production, um, we are talking about things like herbicide resistance or insect resistance in crops. Now, of course, when we start talking about the, the traits and genetically modified organisms and genetically modified crops, there's more crops than just the, the probably the main three or four that we think about. What usually comes to most people's mind is corn. And in corn, usually we're talking about herbicide resistance as well as insect resistance. Okay, awesome. So how do those traits, the herbicide resistance, pest resistance, anything like that, how is that helpful to farmers? Right, so ultimately what we're looking at doing is improving agronomic performance. Um, and we're also looking at minimizing inputs and especially the use of harmful pesticides. And so when we look at crops that are naturally susceptible to a specific um, insect, of course, in corn, um, we're, we're looking at either the corn earworm or we're looking at the corn rootworm. 
Um, when producers are having to use pesticides, they're not only introducing them, themselves to exposure to that pesticide, but also just the exposure in the environment. And so by having that trait reduces the amount of pesticides that have to be used um, by that producer, which is extremely beneficial. So there are a lot of people, I am on a few homesteading Facebooks, um, and I try to keep my mouth shut because a lot of people aren't very open-minded to the idea of GMOs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that a lot of people kind of discuss or debate is that it's some like unnatural departure from farming. What is what is your take on that from the more sciencey, knowledgeable background point of view? Actually, I would say no. Again, we are talking about just speeding up that natural breeding process. And so, of course, in order to introduce that trait into the plant, you know, that is actually being done, you know, first in the lab, but then they are in the field breeding those plants so that that trait is carried through into the next generation. So even though we have science to help speed up the rate of adoption, you know, we are not talking about something that's necessarily unnatural. And of course, when we talk to groups that you mentioned, possibly homesteader groups, or even just um, regular consumer who's not familiar with agricultural production, usually, again, they always think about corn. And that's why I spoke to uh, corn and the use of whether it's the insect trait in corn or even herbicide resistance. Um, but there are many other crops that have been genetically modified that people are not even aware of. Um, there are close to 29 crops that have been genetically modified, crops that include cotton, um, co apples. Um, there is a new apple variety that actually has been genetically modified so that there's delayed browning in that apple, which when we think about food waste, you know, that's really beneficial. You know, people, they see a brown, an apple that has started to brown, they throw it away. And so, you know, that's something that is um, beneficial, you know, down the pipeline when we think about food waste. In addition to, um, of course, crop production, there are pharmaceuticals. And so that's another area that we rarely visit about is the use of genetic modification in, in pharmaceuticals. And of course, insulin becomes one of the uh, probably most prevalent pharmaceuticals that has been genetically modified. And the ability to use genetically modified insulin has saved millions of lives, as well as made um, insulin affordable for so many diabetics. And so there's a lot of um, use of genetic modification beyond crop production. Yeah, that was one thing. I did a little more research because I've been out of college I don't know, six or seven years and all I can change in science in six or seven years um I had no idea that insulin was kind of in that lane I, mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was a thing so it was really surprising to me um can you just I know you could talk about this probably for hours can you give like a basic overview of how the selective breeding happens for a trait versus how GMO happens okay so um Yes. And, and that's the thing. It, it's it's really, this is something that becomes, because I'm not a breeder, probably harder for me to condense into a, a few moments versus somebody who does this on a daily basis. Right. Of course, when we talk about traditional breeding, we are talking about taking two plants of um, the same species and whether it's, you know, cross pollination um, between a, a plant with a male and female flower, or even on a plant that has um, the ability to self-pollinate, you know, we're, ta we're, we're taking the pollen off of one and introducing it to the other. And so you're looking for the expression of the desired trait in the next generation. And so as to be expected, if we are doing this every year with traditional breeding and we're only doing this in one environment, you know, you don't necessarily know until the next year is the trait that you want to see or hope to see actually expressed. And so it's really up to um, 
you know, the, the, you're not able to necessarily control the genetic expression. Now, of course, breeders do have an understanding of what trait might be predominant versus not. And so, you know, they're able to use that knowledge as they do those traditional breeding programs. But because it takes a year to really identify if that trait's being expressed, it can take years to actually achieve um, a variety or um, a hybrid that you are with traits that you're hoping to see. And of course, today, many breeders do have breeding programs in many different geographies so that they can have multiple generations in a year. Um, even um, our sorghum breeding program, for example, within Texas A&M, our breeder has plots in the Rio Grande Valley. He also has plots in the Texas High Plains. And so that allows him to not only have multiple generations in a year, but also see the impact of the environment on the expression. And so that's another thing that becomes um, impactful. You know, how does the environment impact the expression of that trait? So um, now if we think about genetic modification and of course what they are doing in the lab, they are actually using a um, a process called uh, recombinant DNA technology. So essentially um, developing genetic modified traits using biotechnology. And so what they are able to do, they are taking a piece of the DNA with the gene of interest and they're isolating that and then attaching it to a cloning vector. And then for lack of a better term, um, they are um, actually inserting that into the DNA of the, the, the plant or the, the species that they want that in. So there's lots of discussion about, oh my gosh, you know, cockroach genes or insects and, you know, we're doing all these things and we're introducing all that and we are not, or we breeders are not doing that at all. And this is possible because when we talk about DNA, um, all organisms share the same chemical structure. So that DNA, you know, structure is, is the same across all organisms. And so they can actually take this piece of DNA that has the gene of interest and insert that into something else. And then hopefully that becomes expressed. Now, of course, when we talk about doing this, you know, yes, it is, it's in the lab and it's with science, but they can't just go out and release these plants immediately. Um, when we talk about genetically modified traits, and plants that have a genetic modif genetically modified trait, these are probably the most researched traits and plants in the world, or I shouldn't say probably, they are. They are the most researched in the world. And not only are they researched um, to evaluate the performance and are they performing as we would hope, but also they're tested against all the known allergens. They're tested, you know, for food safety. You know, all of these different components that, um, or say concerns that people have, these, all these traits and um, plants are, are heavily tested and heavily regulated. I think one of the things that gets consumers a lot. One, it's the whole genetic modification and it's lots of big science words. If you try to go research anything, um, and I mean, I have a background in it and I'm still like Googling what the word is in layman's terms so that I can understand it better. So there's a lot of misunderstanding and probably a lot of miscommunications. People see those big words and they're like, oh, that's no, we'll just stick to tomatoes. Right. <laughs> and I think you are exactly right, because right there, I think it's genetic modification that is so frightening. And it really is. I mean, if you think about, oh, my gosh, they're modifying genes. This is bad. But we have to keep in mind that in everything we do um, as a you know, human race, genes are modified, you know, and even just, you know, you and I as a person, you know, when our parents had us, there was genetic modification that happened, you know, and so genetic modification happens, you know, just on a daily basis. And even as we look at things like, um, well, one, one very simple um, example is plants that might be naturally resistant, say, to um, a, a pathogen, um, they can actually lose that resistance naturally because those pathogens naturally change and evolve. Um, one of the things we see is in wheat. Uh, wheat varieties are naturally bred and it takes lots of years to breed um, wheat varieties that are resistant to rust. 
Um, but rust actually does change. The strain of that rust will change. And so over time, what was resistant to rust 10 years ago is no longer resistant because there's a new strain. Now, that's not because in the lab we change the strain. It just happens over time. You know, it's, you know, not any different than, than people. You know, our traits change, you know, as, as we have children and as our children have children. And um, it's, it's just natural selection. Yeah. A lot of times when I speak with my people in my programs, when we talk about GMOs or anything, I kind of relate it to the flu vaccine. Yes. Like we can have vaccines for all these different flu varieties, but eventually it's going to mutate. It's going to change. And we're going to have to come up with a new variety to be able to treat it. That's exactly right. And that's why we see a, a change every year in that vaccine. And of course, we, we talk about antibiotic resistance and the exact same principle. Bacteria naturally adapt. And it's just because, you know, at the cellular level, they're able to um, adapt to, you know, all these changes in their own environment. Well, it's kind of crazy, but like, they're just trying to survive too. We don't want them to survive, but they're just trying to survive too. That's right. It yeah. really is crazy, but that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, We're going to, I'm going to ask you some questions related to some comments that I've seen in those homesteading, more natural pathic groups, things like that. And I just want to know your take on them. So if you okay. agree, if you disagree and why. So the first one is I only buy non-GMO seeds. Can consumers get GMO seeds, like regular general consumers? If I walk into a tractor supply or a hardware store or anything, am I going to be able to get my hand on GMO seeds? Yes. And I would say mo more than likely, most of the seeds that are sold in the seed packets, you know, at our lawn and garden centers are going to be non-GMO. And that is because most of those species just have not been um, modified. Now, that said, there are some horticultural crops that have been genetically modified. Um, but of course, on that packet, it is going to say if it is genetically modified or not. And so if a consumer is very, very concerned about that. You know, they should always look at the packaging. But then again, most of our horticultural crops um, have not been genetically modified. Yeah. Um, the next one is I only buy a product if it says that it's non-GMO. So what products can consumers actually get their hands on that might have some GMO tie-in with them? So I will say that, you know, a lot of the labeling is marketing. Um, you know, it's like seeing um, a, a, a package of candy that says that it is gluten-free when it doesn't have any wheat in it anyway. It's all sugar. Um, you know, it, it's because the consumer does not understand. And so, you know, the consumer's always looking for these hot topics, whether it's gluten or GMOs or organic. And so a lot of this is marketing, but that said, you know, for, again, for those who are concerned, it is important that people understand then what crops might have some genetic modification. So um, of course I mentioned, you know, corn being a hot one, um, cotton, you know, there's another, you know, one that's at the top of the list, soybeans, canola. Now, when we start looking at labeling and packaging, a lot of food contains canola oil. So, you know, indirectly, you know, there could be canola oil, canola that was processed and the oil um, byproduct, you know, that could have dried from one. So if someone's concerned, maybe they should stay away from anything that contains canola oil. Um, there's other um, products such as eggplants, um, some melon varieties. I don't know offhand which, which ones, but, you know, again, you know, doing your own research and doing our own homework and, and really looking for scientific references, you know, could be of extreme, um, importance. Tomatoes, there are actually, that was actually one of the first genetically modified crops that was marketed. It was the flavor saver tomato. And it was um, a tomato that was bred so that in the store, um, you know, it, it wouldn't ripen too fast and, you know, it had a longer shelf life. So, you know, back to, you know, food spoilage and what an issue that really is when we start talking about just 
you know, concerns with food waste. Um, there's some peppers, uh, there's some sugar beets. So, uh, you know, a lot of our candies now, of course, that said, you know, candies, a lot of the sugar actually does come from sugar beets. And so, you know, if someone's concerned about that, and as I use my candy analogy, well, you know, there's cane sugar versus sugar beet sugar. So understanding what sugar source is actually used could be of um, importance. Um, there's a, a new rice um, that is actually on the market now. It's not available in the U.S., but it's the golden rice. So that's something that as we talk about genetic modification and traits, well, here is a crop that has been genetically modified um, um, so that it actually has a higher nutrient content. And so when we look at parts of the world where there are nutrient deficiencies, you know, it's so valuable to have crops that are more nutrient dense. And in America, we are really blessed that we have options. We can go to the store and most people have the luxury to say, I'm not going to eat that. But in many parts of the world, they do not have that luxury and they don't have the access to all the pro produce and the diversity of nutrients um, really that the human body needs so that there aren't secondary health issues. So, um, you know, there, there, there's another example right there. Um, uh, nicotine. There's actually been nicotine that has been genetically modified so that it does have um, re reduced nicotine levels. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, I always find it interesting people who are adamant, you know, I am not going to eat this, I'm not going to eat that, but then they're not aware of all of the products or all of the uses and the benefits of the, of the technology um, I think, you know, it goes back to education, why it's always so important that we stay on top of um, the science that's coming out. And I learn something new every day. And I'm sure since I've done this research, there's probably even more crops and, and more traits that are available. Oh, yeah. And I know one of the things, um, some of the labels aren't even saying like produced with genetically modified crops anymore. They're saying bioengineered crops. So right. now... Like we have this whole new wave of like, oh, they're bioengineering things. Oh, y'all, it's the same thing. Right, right. <laughs> and it's it's all because of the tech or the terminology and people being fearful of the terminology. So it's kind of like, okay, well, let's use a different terminology. And then it's, yes. And then it's even more jarring because there's mm -hmm. new scary words coming out. <laughs> all right. No, that was great. Um, This is one of my favorite ones that I love hearing because I actually became really familiar with the research study that it came from and why it got redacted and stuff. But one of the big things that gets said is I've heard that GMO foods cause cancer. Are there any actual studies? Because the one that I'm aware of got redacted because they were not correctly doing the study. So are there right. any studies that actually show that? No. So there are not any studies that link GMOs directly to cancer. And there has actually been a lot of research evaluating um, the increased rates of cancer, um, not only in the United States, but also in Europe um, over the last 50 years. And why it's really important, I think, that we step back and, and compare ourselves to Europe and the European Union is that they do not allow any GMOs. So when we look at the increased rates of cancer, this is occurring in countries where GMOs are consumed and in countries where GMOs are not consumed. And so for that reason, we really do need to step back and look at what are other environmental factors that we are all exposed to. And maybe there's some lifestyle um, choices, you know, across the globe, you know, as we look at, you know, just plastics and everything else um, that are not directly related to GMOs. And of course, the study that you're talking about where the, um, the trial was redacted, sadly, that was already out on the internet, which is, you know, really a lesson that once something's on the internet, whether it's right or wrong, Ooh, yeah, you can still find it. It's right. It's out there. And in that study, um, of course, what they had done is evaluate mice. I think this is probably the one that you're yeah. referencing. And the mice that um, they were going to feed um, 
corn too that was bt corn they actually um had used mice that were prone to tumors so you know right there was a design flaw and then they also rather than growing corn that had been treated with um glyphosate in the field they treated the corn grain itself with glyphosate before they fed it to the mice and so you know that's you know direct consumption of that at a very high dose now that said someone's going to come back and say oh my gosh but eating roundup but the thing is when we spray pesticides um we are using those at a labeled rate all producers are and also it is not being sprayed on the grain itself it's also being sprayed at a labeled stage and um when we look at of course the use of these pesticides um producers are are are, are good stewards of that they do not want to abuse any technology and because and they are also very cautious about their exposure and, and about exposure of their family members and so as we consider you know how that study was designed um the the the, the implication from that and the the i i guess you know the the negative press you know really just was detrimental it was crazy and it's still around i mean i see it all the time on threads and facebook feeds and stuff that exactly they're still tied in and one thing i want to say um i grew up my family produced corn and soybeans in illinois um we don't want to put any extra money into those crops than we have to exactly and those chemicals are not cheap <laughs> They're not, they're not. And of course, and that's one of the values when we talk about um, genetic modification and the ability for producers to use safer herbicides. That's something that when we talk about herbicide resistance, um, herbicide resistance in these crops has allowed producers to use a safer herbicide. And of course, Roundup is one that has a, it, it photodegrades. It does not, it is, does not have a, a high LD50, meaning that it's not going to be persistent in the environment for an extended period. And so safety is a, a is a, a concern for everyone. And yeah. Okay. One last uh, theory from the groups. Almost all crops today are GMOs. They're unlabeled and impossible to avoid. And that is absolutely fiction. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, that genetically modified crops and traits are the most researched crops on the market. That is 100% true. And companies cannot just go develop a genetically modified crop and release those to be grown. So when we talk about um, the regulation, there are actually three agencies that do regulate genetically modified traits and crops. We have the EPA, um, that, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, and they do regulate and test for environmental safety. We also have the USDA, our U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they evaluate the crop um, to determine if it's safe to grow. And then we have the FDA. And so one thing that really comes to my mind when I start seeing that there's all these three um, regulating entities, and of course the FDA is our Food and Drug Administration, and they regulate whether it's safe to eat. You know, again, this is a highly regulated crop. And what most consumers don't realize is that vitamins on the store shelf are not even regulated by the FDA. And, you know, we see vitamins and we think, oh, these are good, and they are, but this is something that's not regulated. And so, again, genetically modified traits and crops are highly regulated for safety, not just environmental safety, but for human safety. And so I really do think that that um, helps bring assurance or should help bring assurance to the consumer if they are concerned about using these traits. Now, that said, there's a lot of crops are grown that are not genetically modified. Um, currently, we do not have genetically modified wheat on the market. And so, you know, when you look at a package of bread that only contains wheat, if it says GMO free, well, there's something else. It would be the canola. Maybe it's the sugar. You know, there's something else, but it's not the wheat. Um, sorghum, that's another crop that's grown quite a bit, especially for livestock feed. You know, that is a crop that has not been genetically modified. And again, even with corn, not all corn is genetically modified. Producers can still buy 
corn that does not have um, genetic modification. And we see that, you know, grown regularly, you know, in organic production or just by producers who are not interested in using one of those traits. Yeah. My favorite one is GMO free orange juice on the shelves. I love yes. that. <laughs> yes. And right there, I mean, with that one, okay, there's nothing in that at all. I mean, you know, you know, if it's sugar-free, if it's natural, 100% pure orange juice, um, straight off of the tree. Yes. That's my there. favorite one. And I yeah. laugh every time I see it. And I know how many people are like, oh, I'm going to buy this one because it says it's GMO free. And I'm like, doesn't matter. There right. Are- and that's really where I think so many people's mindset is driven by marketing. You know, we see that and it's like, oh, this should be a concern. And so I'm going to get this one. And that kind of skews their view of everything else on that shelf. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to wrap up. But do you have any other thoughts or a take home message that you want the viewers to really remember? I want to really commend you for bringing this to your audience. I really do think that ag education, ag literacy is so important. And even for consumers who are not directly involved in agriculture, we are all consumers. And it's always important that we are educating ourselves about what we are eating so that we can make the best decision for ourselves and for our families. And it's wonderful that we do have options. And so you know, that's, you know, something to always consider just because we might not agree with something. We are blessed to have options. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you for coming on, Jordan. I really appreciate it. Um, Yes. I think we got some good information and I will say this is probably one of the videos that I will share over and over and over again, because it is one of the few topics that I will soapbox on for hours if I get the chance. (laughs) So thank you for soapboxing so that I didn't have to. No, yes, thank you for having me. This has been You Should Know. Don't forget to leave us a thumbs up and a comment about what you learned today. We're so glad you stopped by. And as always, if you'd like to reach out to us, email us at youshouldknowwithdanae at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.